Hi everyone, this is the video lesson for 5.3 Optimization Problems Involving Exponential Functions Part 1 Let's take a look at the warm-up What are the steps to solve an optimization problem? If you think about the general approach, there are six major steps and you have to be mindful because not every example will require you to go through all these steps. But if you understand these six steps, you can pretty much solve any verb problems from this chapter. Step one, you have to write down what you want to optimize. And of course, either you're trying to maximize something or you're trying to minimize something. Those are the only two categories that you're thinking about. And even this branches off into two different cases. Sometimes you're finding the maximum or the minimum for all space. And others are where you're confining this between A and B. So again, this is where step six would change depending on step one. If you're confining it, then you're comparing them. And if you're not confining it, then you wanna verify this using the second derivative test. Now, step two is you wanna set up f of x. And to set up f of x, there are two ways of looking at this. You can either look at the equation of constraint, which will help you isolate from one unknown in terms of the other. So you can express f of x in terms of one unknown. The second method, of course, is whenever possible, you can draw a diagram just to help you see all the corresponding variables. Now, the three steps we're gonna to use today for sure are step three, four, and five. And these steps are very similar to the steps that we've talked about from curve sketching. And these steps are step three, find a derivative, step four, set the derivative to be zero, and step five, solve for x. And if you think about curve sketching, solving for x in this case, you're really just solving for critical points. And again, when you think about critical points, it could be a maximum or a minimum. Now, step six is something that I really want you to think about especially when I write it in terms of either comparing it or verifying it using the second derivative test. So if you're given an example where x is going to be in between two numbers, then you're really comparing the critical points along with the endpoints to figure out which point is the largest and which point is the smallest. And that way you can determine the maximum and minimum respectively. And again, you know, I'll even add a fourth point, f of d. Sometimes this point is outside the domain. And of course, in that case, it's going to be rejected. And again, we'll show you some examples in the lesson to make this a bit more clear. The second idea behind step six is verified. And most students don't really do this, right? And if they don't do this, sometimes they mix up the maximum with the minimum. So we can verify the maximum or the minimum using the second derivative test. And all you're doing is you're finding the second derivative and you're plugging it back in. So if you plug in the critical point in the second derivative, if it's gonna be positive, this means it's gonna be concave up, which really means it's gonna be a minimum. On the other hand, if the second derivative of the critical point is negative, it's gonna be concave down, which means you've confirmed it is the maximum. So again, those are the six steps in general. We're gonna use some of these steps in the lesson today. Example one, find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum values of the given functions on the indicated intervals. So y equals to e to the power of x, where x is confined between negative one and five inclusive. So we go straight to step three because you have the function set up for you, you know exactly what you're looking for. So you find the derivative, and again, remember from the lesson earlier on, the derivative of e to the x is still going to be e to the x. Step four, you find the critical point by setting it to zero. And again, if you've done enough homework by now, you would discover that it is okay that you cannot find the critical point. So the answer is there are no critical points. And again, in case you're not sure why there's no solution, let's add a side idea for you just to make sure it's very 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 clear if you think about y equal to e to the x it's going to look roughly something like that 
And of course, you could argue there's a horizontal asymptote. That's true, even though that's not the major focus. And now, <clears throat> if you graph y equal to 0, which is basically a horizontal line at y equal to 0, these two lines will never meet. There's no POI, there's no point of intersection, which is why there are no solutions. Now, just because there are no critical points does not mean there are no maximum or minimum. So what you have to do now is move on to the following step, step six, and you want to compare them. So again, what are you really comparing? Ideally, you compare the critical points with the endpoints, but there are no critical points. So you simply go back and say, okay, let's look at the endpoints, which are at negative one and five respectively. You can take the calculator, you can do it mentally, but if you plug negative one back to the function, this would give you e to the power of negative one or one over e. And likewise, if you plug in five back into the function, that's gonna be e to the power of five. And again, you can tell by inspection, or if you wanna verify with a calculator, that's fine too. One over e is gonna be smaller, which means that's gonna be the minimum. And e to the five is larger, which means that's gonna be the maximum. To be a bit more clear, write down a final statement. Therefore, the absolute maximum occurs at five, e to the five. And again, form the habit of writing down the location, not just the x value. Likewise, therefore, the absolute minimum is gonna be located at negative one and one over e. Now, let's over deliver. Let's show you a little bit more. They didn't really ask you to graph this, but I'm gonna graph it anyways. I wanna make sure you can really see graphically why this makes perfect sense. So again, this is not a perfect scale, but it's good enough in terms of showing you what we're trying to do here. So if you draw a graph of y equal to e to the power of x, it's gonna look something like this. So again, we're confining this between negative one and five. So two, three, four, and five. Let's label this as five. That's negative one. Now the graph is gonna look something like this. And that's y equal to e to the power of x. Now specifically what happens is when x is five, the corresponding y value is gonna be e to the power of five. I'm leaving it in exact form. And again, that's the absolute maximum. Now on the other side, if you look at this point, when x is negative one, the corresponding y value is gonna be one over e. And again, you can label this as the absolute minimum. And the reason why this makes sense, and let me just add the horizontal asymptote quickly. Uh, the reason why this makes sense is because you're not looking at the function for all space. You're confining this specifically between negative one and five inclusive, and that's how you know. So that is example one, part A. And let's keep going. Example one, part B. Y equals to e to the power of x divided by one plus e to the x, where x is in between zero and four inclusive. So again, you're starting with steps three, four, and five, which are taking the derivative, setting it to zero, solving for x. Now again, in this case, since it's a fraction, you're gonna apply the quotient rule. There's six steps. Step one, you square the bottom. The second step, you can copy the bottom to the top. The third step is you take the derivative of the top minus. Second last step is copying the top. And of course, the final step is to multiply by the derivative of the bottom, which is e to the power of x. Step two, or I should say step um, four, according to the algorithm, you're setting it to zero and you're solving for x. Now, ideally, you do want to look at the bottom as well as the top. If you focus on the top, notice how there's a common factor of e to the x you can bring to the front. In the brackets, it's gonna be one plus e to the x minus e to the x. And if you collect like terms, this would give you exactly zero. And again, zero equals to e to the x, which is very similar, right, to the first case, 1a. We found no critical points. Let me just kind of make this 
comparison. This is happening again, right? So we know there are no solutions, right? Now, in case you're thinking, can I understand this from a different approach? Do I need to graph? And the answer is no, you don't have to graph it. You can still understand this by taking the lawn of both sides. And again, the opposite of E is lawn. And again, what happens is this is going to be X, but lawn of zero, that's not possible. Lawn of zero, that's not possible. And again, if you like, you can add a diagram just to kind of justify why this is the case. Again, this is something that you should have done even in uh, MHF for you. So when you think about y equal to ln x, which looks like that, again, there's a vertical asymptote, x equal to 0, y equal to ln x. So by definition, the domain for this function, x must be positive, and that's why you can't take the ln of 0. So again, you know, you look at this and you say, well, this means there are no critical points, and that's perfectly okay. There are no critical points. Now you could also look at the denominator, let's not dismiss that. Let's draw a line in the middle to separate this. You still want to figure out what happens when f prime does not exist or it's undefined. And if you look at the bottom, 1 plus e to the x quantity square. When you work this out, again, I'll leave that to you, but you discover, again, there are no solutions. And uh, if you don't think that's right, you can comment below and I'll follow up on this, but there are no solutions there. So you've done step three, four, and five, you move on to step six, and you're now comparing. So again, ideally, you compare the endpoints along with the critical points, but since there are no critical points, you look at the endpoints, which are at zero and four. Again, you're gonna plug it back to the original function right here. And when you do that, for f of zero, that's gonna be e to the power of zero divided by one plus e to the power of zero, which is 1 over 2. Likewise, f of 4 is going to be e to the 4 divided by 1 plus e to the 4. And if you take the calculator and you work this out, this is approximately to one decimal place, 1 or 1.0. 1 so again, the smaller number is the minimum. The larger number is the maximum. So from here, you can even write down the fact that the absolute minimum is located at 0. 0 0.5 and the absolute maximum occurs at 4 and 1 or 1.0 if you round this to one decimal place and that is the first part of 5.3 I hope this makes sense